What is hybrid ablation for atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation ablation has been around since the early 2000s, late 1990s. At that time, it was very primitive. I remember back when I was training at Stanford in early 2000s, even just approaching what you know would be considered easy these days, one wall or less than one wall to where the AFib triggers around the corners or where the veins, the pulmonary veins insert into that chamber. That's where AFib cells always, sources always start. Took eight, nine hours, had a 50, 60% success rate, a seven to 10% rate of complications and was extraordinarily difficult. And now fast forward, people can freeze that in an hour and get good results, 80, 90%. The more challenging thing is attempting to do these more advanced cases, long-standing persistence where you have three, four, five, or even six walls worth of these AFib triggers or sources. Some of us have the skills to do that, some people not. So it depends in the later stages. Now, this is all doing things from inside, which is safer than actual surgery on the outside of your heart. There was a surgical ablation technique from the mid 1980s called the maze procedure. It was a surgeon came up with a procedure where he actually made scars on the outside of the heart to interrupt the electricity, just the same way we make burns or freezes to create scar from the inside, except from the outside of the heart. He used a scalpel cut uh, into the muscle tissue and then sewed it up to create scars. It was almost like creating a maze. And it was a very extremely complicated lesion set with lots of lines throughout the right and left upper chamber of the heart, the right and left atria. It seemed to hit most of these AFib sources and triggers and kind of root electricity through a defined pathway. The person stayed in normal rhythm and it had a very high success rate, even for very advanced cases of AFib, like persistent and long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. This was the so-called maze procedure or cut and sew procedure. Of course, that involved open heart surgery and also was, took a lot of skill to cut the heart and sew it up. In the present era, some cardiothoracic surgeons have tried to replicate that using newer technologies like a cauterization catheter or a freezing catheter from the outside of the heart and have been able to pretty much replicate the original cut and sew maze lesion set in a modern setting. But it's still an extremely involved open heart surgery type procedure that most institutions are not doing. The, the handful of centers who are really doing a complex lesion set all throughout the left upper chamber and the right upper chamber, like the original lesion set, is, is very small. Most of the places, in my experience, that are saying they're doing a maze procedure, they're just freezing some circles around the corners of that first wall, kind of like what we do on the inside, doing one wall, which you can freeze from the inside in an hour and have 80-90% success rate if you're at an early stage. It, it, it's just not enough. Like was said, it matters what you do not just necessarily the energy source. If you have a bigger force fire, you need to do more to get rid of it all. If you just do a portion of it, you're not gonna get it. So there's this belief that from the original maze procedure that any type of surgical thing is somehow better than what we do from the inside. And that's, in my opinion, not completely true. It is true that one of the things that limited us from getting rid of a lot of stuff, those of us who have been doing advanced ablations from the inside, not just doing one wall, is making a deep enough lesion because sometimes the AFib triggers or cells are deep in the tissue and you try to make too deep a lesion from the inside, you can make a hole in the heart wall. So it takes a lot of experience. These days we have force sensing so we can tell how much force we're putting in that allows us to crank up the power to make deeper burns in different areas. With skill and experience, you can minimize making holes in the walls of the heart. Whereas the surgeon has the heart from the outside, they can make a more complete lesion from the get-go, but that involves open heart surgery. Most surgeons, in my experience, are not doing a complete Cox maze three procedure. They are just burning that first wall, usually when they're already in there for some other reason, like a valve replacement surgery or a bypass operation. And I think the view is, well, hey, maybe this works, maybe this doesn't, but it's so easy for us to do. We have the heart sitting in our hands. And so therefore, if it works, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. They're not really, necessarily looking at what stage of AFib is this person in. They're not trying to wake up the AFib or see how many walls it's on. They're just doing it um, anatomically and saying, well, I'm just gonna do this simple one wall ablation. And that's why if you have a more advanced stage of AFib, persistent or long-standing persistent, and, and you've had that done as part of your open heart surgery, a lot of times it just wasn't enough. And you're like, it's like they didn't do anything. 
We do see that a lot. If you were to go to one of the centers that does a complete, very extensive Cox Mace 3 procedure, that's big. Open heart surgery is very invasive and you would only have that done if you had open heart surgery for other reasons. It really gets to what you do, not necessarily always how you do it. Some of us can replicate almost completely the Cox Mace 3 full lesion set from the inside, but that's a very advanced ablation and not everybody does that. They came out with a procedure called a hybrid procedure. Looking at well, a lot of people, even for these advanced cases, just do that first wall. They go around the corners where those pulmonary veins insert, and that's kind of where AFib always starts. A lot of people are just kind of doing that even if the person's a more advanced stage, persistent or long-staying persistent. And as we said, the statistics on that is they're probably only going to get a 40-50% success rate because it's just not enough. And then they'll bring them back two or three times and do a little bit with the catheter and then probably end up putting them on a strong medication to try to suppress the rest. So they came out with a hybrid procedure where they said, look, you know, doing the open heart surgery it either requires open heart surgery for some other reason, or if the person was going to do a standalone, they have to make multiple holes to the outside of your heart to reach all the different areas. And that's really invasive. So they came up with a way where they just made one hole underneath your sternum, the breastbone. They put this catheter on the outside of your heart, and then they just cauterize that whole back wall, part of the roof, and then the whole back wall. So they get with the roof, the back wall, and with the floor. And then they have the electrophysiologist come in a day later or a little bit later and then complete the ablation by getting rid of stuff in the corners, which is that standard ablation that where they do, you know, where people do that first wall or parts of the first wall. Now, that definitely is doing more and it definitely has a higher success rate with persistence and long staying persistence because you're instead of doing half of one wall from the inside, regardless of the stage of the AFib. It, by adding it with what the surgeon's doing, they're doing, you know, two to three walls out of the six, but it's still two to three walls out of the six walls. It's not making lesions on all six walls the way the original cut and sew maze that had such high success rates or the few centers who do that in a very extensive way. So once again, if you have a big forest fire, that still may not be enough. That's why if you look at people who have persistent or long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, if you just do parts of the back wall, whether it be from the inside or outside, you're gonna get a 40, 50% success rate. If you add the hybrid portion and break it up into two procedures with the surgeon and the electrophysiologist doing a little bit each, that ups the success rate for long-standing persistent AFib to get them completely back to normal rhythm up to 50 to 60%, which in my opinion is just still slightly better than flipping a coin. Whereas if you do the full Cox Maze lesion set from the outside, you can get an 89% range. Some of us can do a more complex lesion set from the inside doing more walls in that and, and approach more of the 75-80% success rate with these later stage cases. So once again, it kind of just depends on your alternatives. You have a long-standing persistent or persistent AFib and everyone's just doing parts of the back walls around the corners where those pulmonary veins insert. And you say, hey, but they offer the hybrid. Well, then go into the hybrid because it's probably going to get more of those AFib cells than what they would the standard way. But if you can find a, a center that does more complex ablations from the inside, then you probably will have a higher overall success rate because you need more and they can do more. But it just depends on what's being done in your area. But it's what you do, not necessarily always how you do it. And so lastly, because they don't do that much on the inside, for the persistent or long-standing persistent patients. They do multiple procedures, but they're just doing a little bit each time. They're really not doing all the walls that need to be done. And so what they'll do is they'll then, if, if you're, say for example, somebody whose AFib has progressed, 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 and now you're in it 70, 80% of the time, and maybe you're on the second strongest drug to keep that asleep. And let's say that drug can suppress 70% of the walls worth of AFib and you've progressed 75 to 80% and now you're breaking through that drug. And you don't want to go to the strongest drug and then fail that and let it become permanent. So you say, okay, do an ablation. The person does like a simple one wall ablation, uh, maybe with the cryo balloon to freeze it. So that's like getting rid of 15, 20% of the 75%. So that got you from 75% worth of AFib cells to maybe 50 to 60% worth of cells. Now. If that's all they did, they would not be able to stop that drug that's suppressing 70% because you'd still be in it 50, 60% of the time. But what they do is they don't stop the drug. 
they even do the ablation on that drug. They're just doing it anatomically. They don't try to get rid of everything. They just go, well, I'm gonna do that first wall, get rid of some of it, and keep that person on that drug to keep the rest suppressed. So if you've got 75% worth of cells and the drug can suppress 70%, and somebody gets it from 75% to 50, 60%, and then keeps you on that drug, you might do great for a year or two because now you made the first small enough that the drug is able to keep the rest asleep. But did you really get rid of the bulk of it or did you get rid of all of it? No, you didn't. I had a patient who came for a second opinion where that happened and after a year or two, they started having breakthrough again and they're like, why am I having recurrence so quickly? Well, because they didn't really get rid of that much. They just got rid of a little bit, but I didn't have any symptoms for a year. Yeah, because they kept doing the second strongest drug to keep the rest of it asleep. That's like opening up a blocked heart artery. Let's say it took you 10 years to block up a heart artery from 10% to 50% and to finally 80, 90%. Anything past 75%, it causes chest pain damage, heart attacks. You get to 80, 90%, you have a small heart attack. If somebody opens it up to 60%, the blockage, you might not have any more chest pain because it's below the 75% blockage. But it's gonna grow from that spot. So in a couple of years, you're back up to 80% blocked and you have another heart attack. And then you go, well, why didn't you open it up to zero to 10%? Maybe I would have gotten another 10 years. To me, I think that's sort of similar. If somebody just does a little bit and keeps you on that drug, it's better than nothing. They did make it better. You were breaking through that drug before and now you're not, but it's not quite the same as if they had gotten rid of it completely or mostly or 90%. Maybe the little bit that's left over, they could have suppressed with a weaker drug and then work your way back up to that stronger drug. So. I feel like if people have the skill to do more, hopefully they will try to do more. But unfortunately, these days, it seems like with the way Medicare and other insurances reimburse, we just get paid for doing something, not necessarily the result. So if somebody just keeps doing something, even if it's incomplete, they will make money at it. So from your patient standpoint, just try to make sure what stage you're at and what your doctor's planning to do, and then just kind of question a little bit, like, why are you doing that? Could you do more? And just know that the bigger the force, the more they're gonna have to do, and just see what they're planning to do. So, you know, knowledge is power, and the more knowledge you have, the better equipped you are to make proper decisions for yourself. For everything atrial fibrillation related, please feel free to go to my website, drscottlee.com, where you're gonna find more resources and also can follow me on social media.